this week on the Back Table podcast. And when you look at the way I think healthcare is going to move, I think that a full body wellness approach is going to be necessary, but also desired by our patients. I mean, that's what our patients want. They want to be given the options. They want to be given the opportunity to make some of these changes, but they just need some help. And again, it's been eye opening how much of this easily fits into daily practice. And so just finding that extra one or two minutes to bring it up again, first check your own biases at the door and make sure you're going into this in a very non-judgmental way. But just start doing it a little bit with your patients and kind of taking notice of, is this person really here for the symptom or are they here because they're extremely anxious about what the symptom might mean? Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Backtable ENT podcast, where we discuss all things ENT. We bring you the best and brightest in our field with the hope that you can take something from our show to your practice. Now, a quick word from our sponsor. Our next partner has a product I use literally every day. I started taking AG1 because I was curious and wanted to know what all the hype was about. I had heard it advertised on other podcasts and I had had uh, known some other people who started drinking it and I was like, you know, what's this all about? Now that I've been taking it for several months, I find that I look forward to taking it in the mornings. It's starting to replace my coffee, believe it or not. I take it on empty stomach and it just feels like I am, you know, complimenting the other healthy behaviors that I like to work into every day. Gopi, you want to tell our listeners, you know, what is this stuff? What is this AG1? Wow, it's uh, 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food sourced superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens. I don't know about half of what those are, but they are they they make me feel better, and um, they're uh, make me feel like I'm actually contributing to a, like you know making sure I have a whole all the nutrients that I need in my diet. Do you um, how do you like to mix yours? You know, right now I just do water, about 10 ounces, two ice cubes, two or three at most, and then put the powder in and just shake it up. I find that if I do too many ice cubes, it stays a little clumpy. But if I don't do enough ice cubes, it's not cold enough. Mm, gotta have what about that. you? Do you do it in water, juice, a smoothie? I like cold water, like about 12 ounces, you know, so on the... On the um higher side and um, a couple of ice cubes of water. And then I give it a real good shake, like I'm like I'm shaking up a martini or something, you know, yeah. um, and then <laughs> at 7 a.m. <laughs> 7 a.m. Just like a chick, 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 chick. <laughs> and um, and then I'm out the door and, you know, I feel like it's becoming like a, a necessity. You know, it's like a important part of my day. I also like that it contains one uh, less than one gram of sugar, no GMOs, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything while still tasting good. So I like yeah. it. How do they do like that? The companies. Huh? How do they do that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, right now, it's time for you, our listeners, to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with a convenient daily nutrition, uh, nutritional supplement like AG1. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com backslash backtable ENT. Again, that's athleticgreens.com backslash backtable ENT to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Now back to the show. My name is Gopi Shaw, and I'm a pediatric otolaryngologist. I'm here with my co-host, partner in crime, Dr. Ashley Agan. Hey, good morning, Gopi. Good morning, Ashley. How are you? Saturday morning podcast. It's always good. It's always good. We had the resident graduation last night. You know, it was a lot of fun and it's great to see the graduates super well accomplished and super excited to see all their future endeavors. So it's always nice to see. It's a great time of year. Mm -hmm. Lots to celebrate. All right. Let's get into it. Uh, we've got a great guest today. We have Dr. Jessica Lee. Dr. Lee is a practicing general otolaryngologist at Charleston ENT and Allergy in Charleston, South Carolina. She obtained her medical degree from the Medical University of Mississippi and completed her residency at the Medical University of South Carolina. In addition to general practice, her focus has evolved to include lifestyle medicine as it pertains to otolaryngology. 
Welcome to the show, Jessica. Hi, thank you guys for having me. I'm really pumped about this topic. We're, today we're going to talk about um, lifestyle medicine and how that uh, fits into an ENT practice and how we can kind of take some tips and tricks from Jessica and learn more about lifestyle medicine. But first, um, let's kick it off to just, you know, hearing about you and your practice and what got you into lifestyle medicine. So really, this started back in residency for me, going through residency, obviously, you don't have a lot of extra time to pursue kind of other interests. But our family, my daughter actually had some medical issues. And unfortunately, traditional pharmaceutical approaches did not work. And so we moved to a dietary therapy, which worked perfectly. And after that, it was like this light bulb went off. And I thought, gosh, they didn't teach us anything like this in medical school or residency for that matter. How have I not heard of this? You know, how is this not a thing that everyone knows about? And so that really just took off from there. And so over the first few years of getting out into practice and starting my own practice, I kind of dabbled, you know, did some online courses here and there and just reading on my own. Over the pandemic years, if you will, I think we all had a little more time on our hands for some of those months. And so I decided to pursue the board certification for lifestyle medicine. It just seemed like a good fit. I kind of looked into all of the other sort of complementary type of practices. And I just felt like this was a really good start because it was a really good foundation. And I was surprised the more I learned about it, how much of it applied to ENT. So Jessica, just for somebody who's super novice, how do you explain lifestyle medicine? How is it different? Is it homeopathic? Is it different than complementary medicine? Is this um, board just for otolaryngologists or is this something that any physician can add to their skill set? The lifestyle medicine uh, idea is really that you can potentially manage, treat, and in some cases reverse chronic illnesses using these sort of tenets or pillars of what we call lifestyle medicine. And that includes things like uh, plant-based nutrition, physical activity that meets guidelines, quality sleep, stress management, emotional connections, mental health, and avoidance of risky substances like tobacco and heavy alcohol use. So that's kind of what lifestyle medicine is. And I honestly had the same question you did in the beginning. I was trying to figure out, wait, what's integrative? What's functional? What's lifestyle? What is all this stuff? And I literally have like a Word document on my computer that kind of outlines it and talks about how do you get credentialed in this one and how do you get credentialed in that one? And so, again, kind of at the end of the day, I just thought, gosh, all of that really makes sense to me. And it's good information. It's not controversial for most people. And so um, that's just where I decided to start. It is a certification that is open to any board certified physician. And they do have an alternative pathway that's a little bit different for um, nurses or other type of ancillary providers. But if you have a board certification, you can apply to do this additional training. And what does that look like? So you had done some courses, but then when you said, okay, I'm going to be board certified lifestyle medicine, what does that entail? So that entailed about a year and a half of prep work for me. It is 30 hours of online CME courses and it is 10 hours of in-person CME. And then you have to study for and, of course, pass the actual board certification exam, which I took this past December. I passed. Congrats. Congratulations. Okay. <laughs> That's important to know. <laughs> yeah. Any board exam is always so daunting, I feel like. It, it was. It's been a few years since I've had to do that. I've been out for a while and I was like, ooh, this is this is interesting going back to this phase of life. Yeah. We did too our complex PD Odo. It was like the first year and it was the same thing. I took it in the fall and I was just, oh my God, having to study and that sort of anxiety of it. It's like, I'm not used to this anymore. Exactly. As far as lifestyle medicine, sometimes, you know, when I think about going back and taking a test for something like that, is there, this is a really detailed question, but is it that you're learning how to manage chronic disease? Like, is it, you know, a patient comes in with um, diabetes and they're on these medications and you implement a diet and now maybe they don't need as much insulin and you're going to manage that? Yes. So in general, that is kind of where lifestyle medicine is geared. It's geared towards a lot of the metabolic type diseases, you know, hypertension, cardiovascular, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, things like that. But again, kind of what I've found is that when you really start digging into the studies that they're referencing and these big epidemiological studies and you start looking through them, you realize that, yes, it applies to those sort of mainstays. And I'm sure we'll talk in a minute about how that actually still filters into ENT, but it also applies to all of these things that we do, like 
gastroesophageal reflux disease and LPR, recurrent upper respiratory infections, allergies, obstructive sleep apnea, all, you know, cancer, certainly upper airway cancer. So it was kind of fun in a way and exciting to pick through these things and go, oh, wow, that's really applicable to what I do every day. I also think it was interesting because I'm going to give you an example. I had a patient in clinic a couple of weeks ago who came in for hoarseness. And as we're doing the history and the exam, turns out he also has a really dry mouth and you know, his membranes are just super tacky and sticky. And we're going through, you know, he drinks plenty of water. We're going through all those questions. And then I look at his med list with him and he's on about three different medications that cause dry mouth as a side effect. And I say, OK, well, what are you on these for? So we walked through it and he's on some of them for pain control and some of them to help with sleep. Well, why are you having trouble sleeping? Well, he's in too much pain to fall asleep. Well, why are you having so much pain? Well, he has diabetic neuropathy. So by like rolling backwards sometimes and following that domino chain, you realize probably a lot of the symptoms people come into our office for can be traced back sometimes to these more systemic chronic diseases. And that's where I was like, oh, aha, okay, we can work on this versus me just giving kind of a Band-Aid solution. So Jessica, for that patient example, do you then kind of manage or just talk to them about dietary modifications in terms of their diabetes? Like how involved as the otolaryngologist with the lifestyle board, do you then get into some of the chronic diseases that we aren't necessarily that well trained in from a medical standpoint? How did you manage that patient? And you're right. You're exactly right, Goopy, that it's a kind of a little bit of a tricky area because my residency wasn't in that, but I've done this additional training in it. And I know how to manipulate things like nutrition in a helpful way. But you're right. I'm not trained to manipulate his insulin, for instance. So that's where it becomes a partnership with his primary care doctor and with the patient, honestly. I mean, the first thing you have to do is see if the patient is even open to this kind of stuff. And I've had some patients who are like, look, I just want the quick fix. And I'm like, OK, I'm here for that, too. But, you know, I have some patients who are like, gosh, I just really don't want another medication. Is there any other option? What else can I do? And those are the ones that I say, you know what, I'd really love to schedule another visit with you. And let's just dedicate that visit strictly to these kind of lifestyle things. And we do. We pick through their, you know, we go through a dietary log with them and see what they eat. We go through a sleep log with them. And it's really, I think, eye opening for them sometimes to see things. So specifically for that patient. He and I talked about some nutritional things and some physical activity changes that can be helpful to reduce diabetic neuropathy. Ultimately, he chose not to do kind of a dedicated follow up for that. But I think it at least gets in his mind. And maybe he then takes that back to his primary care doctor and says, hey, look, I really want to try to get off of some of these meds that are causing other problems. Can we take some time and focus on these other things, too? Yeah, my next question was going to be about time, about if you're during that same visit going into, you know, the diet and all this, because I think that's where the pinch is for me is I really would love to talk to people about what they're eating and if they're sleeping and are they stressed and all these things. But then it's like time's up. By the time we do like the full assessment and we've done the scope, I'm about to walk out the door and it's like, oh, yeah, that's kind of one way I think about it. I've surprised myself sometimes with how little sometimes you have to even ask or say before the patient can take it the rest of the way. And sometimes just asking about it is helpful in itself. I had a patient, she came in for eustachian tube dysfunction, and it was kind of one of these ones where objective measures didn't look severe, but yet symptomatically she felt horrible, I was really bothered by it. At the end of the visit, I was like, you know, let me just mention this. And I kind of went through a little bit of a cognitive behavioral training as far as how to reframe her thoughts around it. And I mean, she teared up and was like, no one's ever explained it to me that way. That makes so much sense. I, I already feel better. So like for her, I think it was really the emotional distress that was keeping her coming to clinic versus the actual mild eustachian tube dysfunction. And so I was just surprised that I'd spent probably 20 minutes explaining the pathophysiology of eustachian tube issues and that didn't seem to make an effect. And then, you know, in 60 seconds of addressing her emotional distress, that was the ticket. Mm, I need to learn that. <laughs> <laughs> There's good mnemonics for it. And that's that's been the fun part because that's the part of the lifestyle training that I didn't expect and that I didn't even think I would like. And I honestly kind of was like, I don't need that. I know how to talk to patients. But learning how to be a coach, learning how to speak to their strengths and role with resistance and things like that. It was really educational. Oh, yeah. I didn't expect that part either. That sounds very enticing and very useful. 
I want to get into the different pillars and kind of dissect it down as far as how that rolls over into your ENT practice. So maybe we could start with the diet part, because that I think that's probably what most people think when they think lifestyle is, oh, you know, yeah, I need to eat better or whatever. Maybe I need to eliminate sugar. What's the typical bullet points for what's important for a, quote, healthy diet that might help patients, particularly in ENT? Mm -hmm. And I'll be clear and say I don't necessarily go through everything with every patient at every visit. But there are certainly visits where I can see this is something we need to talk about. Or maybe we've, you know, like I mentioned before, we say, you know what, we're going to we're going to talk about this in more detail next time. And they're okay with that. But focusing first on nutrition, which probably is the biggest chunk of all of this. It has in some ways probably the most research behind it. And it's very trendy right now. And I hate to say that. So I think it's good to be careful about it. So in the lifestyle medicine frame of thought, the best diet for your overall health and longevity is going to be a plant-based diet. Now, plant-based itself is kind of a fishy term. Some people think it, that it means vegetarian um, or vegan. Some people think it means vegan. So vegetarian, no meat, vegan, no dairy or any animal products. I don't think that's the way that it was intended in some ways. I think of it more as plant heavy or plant founded, where the majority of what you're eating is fruits, vegetables, whole grains and things like that. And then you're, you know, you're having some animal products that are healthier choices, a grilled fish over a fried chicken kind of meat choice. So that's kind of the mainstay. And then you do want to talk about two snacks and things. I think that's where people forget, you know, when I'm talking through with someone and they'll go, oh, yeah, you know, I eat healthy and we'll walk through kind of breakfast, lunch, dinner, and it's not too bad. And then, you know, well, then I have the bowl of ice cream at night before bed or on the weekends I have three or four glasses of wine per night, which I know a lot of some of the decisions about alcohol is a very personal decision and people have different moral or even religious beliefs around it. But when you look at it from strictly a health aspect, there is such a thing as too much. And I mean, I think we can all agree on that. But yeah, so that's kind of the first talk about nutrition is just what are some little changes we can make? This is not about making a drastic, like you need to change your diet overnight. And I really even try not to say diet with patients. I try to talk about like, let's talk about your nutrition and how that affects your body and how it can work for you or work against you. And so focusing on what you can have, what you can substitute versus I don't like to focus on, oh, you've got to stop eating X, Y, and Z. It's more like, hey, let's get more fruits in your diet. So at breakfast, can you add a bunch of blueberries and raspberries on top of your oatmeal or something? Yeah, I think that's always good. When you start talking about taking things away, people will have an immediate knee-jerk kind of resistance. I feel like I've had patients, though, that have said that there seems to be some sort of appeal or sexiness to elimination type diets. And so sometimes people will be like, do you think I need to cut out gluten? Do I need to cut out sugar? Like, do you ever find that any of those types of diets are helpful for Anything in particular in ENT or overall just eat more plants? Does cutting out dairy help the runny kid nose? Oh, yeah. Milk makes mucus. I mean, Is that real? <laughs> you know, I, I, can I, I, I've seen it. I've seen it, right? No, I mean, this is part of it, right? Is there some huge multicenter randomized controlled trial talking about that? No. But are there the studies that look at increased plants and veggies in kids reducing upper airway rhinitis, lower airway wheezing, conjunctivitis, absolutely, like those exist. And so we focus on those. I do, I mean, I want this to be evidence-based and I try to keep it there. But there is some, I think, value to what you see also in your day-to-day -day practice. And the whole dairy thing with kids, I tread cautiously. I've had some parents who are just at their wits end. And so I bring it up as an option. And I say, you know, we can try this for two weeks, see how they do. We're going to add it back in. I'm not advocating that you never again have anything like that. But let's just see what happens for two weeks. And I have been amazed. I mean, I've had kids who were headed towards surgery that ended up not needing it and things like that. So it's it's really interesting. Yeah. And it's also, like you said, I think what the families or the patients, what they want, if they're like, what can I do? I'm willing to try anything. Then you have options. And that's the beauty of, I think, the lifestyle approach is all the different options now. And that's all they want is more information, I feel like, at the end of the day and different things they can try. And I think in addition to more information, just expectations. I mean, if I'm going to do that type of a course, two weeks dairy-free with their kids, I'm going to, number one, tell them what can they can substitute to help make it easier. 
And number two, I'm going to tell them, look, the evidence behind this is not the strongest, but I've seen it help and we can try it. And, you know, I don't push it on anybody. Most people probably think I can do anything for two weeks. Right. I mean, I kind of feel that way. But yeah, I think two weeks, when you look at any of the other restriction diets, and I don't get into a lot of gluten-free or FODMAP or those kinds of things, I do have a patient who is just a really difficult patient with regards to her allergies, her asthma, her nasal polyps. She's done everything. And when I say everything, I mean everything, like all the biologics and nothing is working. You know, she's there. She's like, I want to do anything, even if there's a chance it's going to help. And so I'll let you know what happens, but we're doing sort of a low histamine diet with her for the next couple of weeks, and we're going to see how she feels. What is a low histamine diet? So there is a whole host of foods that are rich in histamine, and obviously your body needs histamine. It is important to a lot of processes, but there is a thought that some people may have sort of a hypersensitivity So it's not that if two people are eating the same diet, they're going to have the same reaction to it. It's just that there may be some genetic susceptibilities. There's a certain enzyme in your gut that's important. And some people have lower levels of that. So if you're unable to sort of process the histamine you're taking in, then there's a thought that it might lead to some increase in these types of symptoms, which for us affects the head and neck. For other specialties, they're thinking about the gut and things like that. What are some examples? Like, What would you be losing if you were on a low histamine diet or decreasing? Classically, eggplant, tomatoes, those are two big ones. Eggplant usually doesn't bother people. Tomatoes usually do. <laughs> oh, interesting. I know. It's like pizza? What? Yeah. And that's the other thing. I, She and I talked about this and I said, you know, there's a lot of good to the foods we're about to cut out for the next two weeks. So we want to be careful. And again, with any time you think of any kind of restrictive diet, you want to be sure that there's an endpoint and that you're going to add these things back in. And you just find that threshold, that balance between what's the level that I feel good at and I still get to enjoy and get the benefits of these nutrients versus when does that balance tip too far. That makes sense. And that's harder, right? There's so many things in the world that are nuanced. It's easier when things are black and white, on or off, in or out. The balance is where it's at, finding the right balance. Finding the right balance. And then like you alluded to earlier, Ashley, Try doing that in a 10-minute appointment, which if your clinics are like ours, it's tight sometimes. So usually those are the times where I'm like, oh, good, the next patient's late. I can spend a few more times with this patient. Or again, let's come back and dedicate some time. Or these are the times where I'm calling people on the phone and we're spending 20 or 30 minutes on the phone, which is maybe economically not the best way for me to do it right now, but it's kind of the way it has to be for now. Is there a way to reimburse for lifestyle medicine counseling? Does that exist yet or not necessarily? This is just part of, you know, you just kind of work it into what you're billing for your visits anyway. So for now, I am pretty much just working it into what the visit is. Most of the billing, when you look at it, is through time-based billing, which is like surgical specialists. We don't do a whole lot of that. But occasionally, again, I've had a few patients who wanted to come back and wanted to spend 30 or 45 minutes. And so I'll use the time-based codes for that. That's how we have to kind of approach it for now. So in terms of incorporating it into your practice, so a patient comes in and let's say it's for OSA and you go through your more, I guess, traditional, I don't know, ENT, HMP or whatnot. You're looking in their nose, looking in their mouth, looking at the BMI, finding out their symptoms, you have a sleep study. And then in your sort of thought process are the pillars like nutrition, physical activity, sleep, emotional health, smoking. Are those also then kind of, okay, I'm going to go through some of these things or or maybe pull out sleep pattern and nutrition or whatever you feel like are the most pertinent. And then you go into those things as well in your history. And then maybe when you do a plan, there might be one or two suggestions. That you make. How do you tie it in, I guess, is my question. The way I approach it is kind of a checklist in my head, like you said, but I will typically pull out what are the maybe one or top two areas I think we can make changes on that will help for this patient. The funny thing was that doing the sleep part of the training was like a cinch because I feel like we get pretty good training when it comes to sleep health and not just obstructive sleep apnea, but most people are pretty familiar with the other sleep disorders and good sleep hygiene and things like that. So those are pretty easy to pull in for that patient. But we may also talk about physical activity. Are they going to work and sitting in a desk job for eight hours and then going home and sitting on the couch, you know? And there's definitely evidence to support either morning or evening activity, depending on kind of what trouble they're having with their sleep. So we'll kind of talk about incorporating that. I don't do a lot of formal questionnaires in the clinic, except for things that we would already do, like an Epworth, for instance. 
So that one kind of fits in really easily. But as far as the formal food questionnaires or physical activity guidelines, those are actually pretty easy. You just kind of have to ask the patients two or three questions. So I don't do a lot of paper questionnaires on the side or in addition to the traditional visits, but there are things I do run through in my head and think, what can we pull out? Or is there anything to pull out? I'm not saying that this is applicable to every patient that walks in the door, but it's been fun finding the ones where it is applicable and spending, you know, extra few minutes talking about it. And then are there certain ENT diagnoses that have more with lifestyle medicine than others? Or is it like, listen, pretty much everything that we do and see has a little bit of lifestyle medicine in it? It's pretty much everything. I mean, really, we've brushed on obstructive sleep apnea. We've brushed on chronic uh, upper respiratory infections or recurrent acute allergies, GERD and LPR. But even things like cancer, I mean, most of us are going to be like, yeah, of course, tobacco and alcohol, that's a contributing factor. But the Arcade study that was done in Europe really pointed out that diet also makes a big difference, even in upper airway cancers. And thinking about how to prepare your patient, whether they're about to go into surgery or chemotherapy and radiation, preparing them nutritionally and being there with them post-treatment nutritionally, making sure that we're meeting their body's needs so they can heal as well as possible. And again, a lot of centers may have a dietitian that helps with that, which is fantastic. But I think some people may see the dietitian once and they get their tube feed sort of prescription and they don't go back. And so as they're starting to reintroduce oral feeding, the old adage was just calories, right? Just put whatever you want in your body as long as it's caloric rich. So a lot of people are like, great, I'm getting the tub of ice cream out. And I try to gear them towards saying, look, it really is important what you're putting in your body. So let's get you a few good smoothie recipes and we can put some spinach in there that you're never going to know is in there because no one really wants to eat that right now. In this point in your life, when you feel terrible, you want the ice cream. But how can we make you like a really delicious smoothie that's also going to support your body's ability to heal from this and hopefully prevent recurrence? Yeah, I mean, I think you are what you eat. I think what we put in our bodies matters so much. And I love hiding my vegetables in things that taste good. <laughs> like, <laughs> I think we all do to some degree. <laughs> Can we talk about the patient that's like, Dr. Lee, I have a great diet. They tell you everything they're eating and you're like, oh, well, like you don't eat any vegetables at all. No, but I blah, 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 X, Y, Z. And they're like, it's not that. Do you just say, okay, and then we'll try to touch on that later. Like, because it's hard. I think sometimes in your mind, you're like, I, I think we could probably work on your diet. But I, if the patient's not ready, then the more you push, the more they're going to push back. Do you have any tips or tricks for how to introduce that idea of nutrition modification without that resistance? You're exactly right that sometimes patients just aren't ready, even if I think it's something worth talking about. And going back to some of the coaching and some of the health behavior change, just information you learn in this course, you learn about all of the different health behavior change models and theories over the past 50 years. And one specifically focuses a lot on the patient's stage of readiness. And so if I have a patient who's at a readiness level three, where maybe they'll kind of admit that there's some things that need to be changed, but they are not at all interested in changing it, that's okay. We don't have to force anything. We just make note of it. And I say, if you ever want to talk about it in the future, I'm here. I'm happy to do that with you. And we move on because you're not going to get anywhere by forcing it down their throats yeah. figuratively. <laughs> <laughs> and so you've got to make sure that you are there to help the patient, not to tell the patient what they need. Again, it's a little more of a coach role in that position versus kind of the old school doctor knows best kind of role. Yeah, it's kind of like... The vaccine conversations, immunization conversation, saline rinses, you know, never works and overdoing them. I can't do <laughs> Right. Just, yeah. Do you fight them? No, you just go, okay, great. Let's figure out what else we can do. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose that it works with every pillar. As far as specifically, like, for example, LPR and reflux, are there particular things where you're like, what if you could just change this one thing that might really make your symptoms better? I think we learn about maybe cutting out coffee or cutting out tomato-based foods or spicy foods or greasy and fried foods. But if you had to just pick one thing, is there something in particular that's like a good recommendation? The nighttime snack bowl of ice cream. 
I mean, I've been amazed by how many people, and it typically is older I patients. I dairy was good for you. kind of cools <laughs> everything down, right? It's so delicious, too. And it is. I don't blame you. But this is the classic approach or picture, right, that the patient comes in with. And they'll say, you know, it really doesn't bother them much during the day that they'll talk about postnasal drip and they'll point to the base of their throat and they'll talk about the phlegm and the throat clearing. And then they'll go, man, you know, when I get up in the morning, I just have to clear and clear. And it takes 30 minutes to get this gunk out. And then I'm okay. And then the next night it happens again. And so those are the ones that go, okay, let's back up. What are you eating the night before? And they'll say, oh, you know, I I eat maybe some chicken or fish and some vegetables, maybe rice or potatoes or something. Great. What time do you eat? They're putting hours between dinner time and bedtime. And so I'm going, okay, check, check. All of that looks good. And then I'll go, you eat dinner pretty early and you don't go to bed till 10 o'clock at night. Do you have any snacks before bed? Well, yeah, sometimes I have a, a maybe a bowl of ice cream. Okay. How many times a week do you typically have that? And they'll go, well, you know, pretty much every night. And I go, okay, I just want you to try something for me. I just want you to try this. And I don't take it away because obviously they need a little something. So I go, I just want you to substitute. Just do a bowl of blueberries instead of your ice cream for two weeks and call me or I'll call them. And I mean, nine times out of 10, that fixes it. So it's funny. It's kind of fun in a way versus being like, here's your Zantac, you know, or here's your Pepsi. We don't do Zantac anymore. But I joke that that's the first thing I think about. But it's different for every patient. For some patient, it may be maybe their alcohol intake increased over the pandemic because they were working from home more. And so maybe we talk about kind of backing off of that a little bit at night, things like that. I love your approach. Like, let's just try this. It's so non-threatening, and I'm sure that's why you've had so much success with your patients, because it's all about the delivery. So I'm taking notes. <laughs> Very non-judgmental. I think that's the key. And I'll even say that out loud. I'll be like, look, I'm about to ask you some questions about your diet. This is non-judgmental. I'm just trying to see if there's anything we can adjust here. That's all. That's cool. So Jessica, for example, let's say you had a patient, uh, what's like the eustachian tube dysfunction patient, looks good on all the objective tests, but let's say she's a smoker. And in terms of something like smoking, in terms of follow-up and management, are you then telling them about the patch or following them up in two months with some sort of regimen on how to cut that out? Or how does that work for you? Because I know there's a lot of counseling and there's definitely a lot of expectations and helping them understand how some of these pillars fit into their symptoms and overall well-being. But then in terms of management and follow-up with the lifestyle aspects, how do you do that? The first step, like we mentioned before, is really determining if they're ready to make that change. And honestly, a lot of people that come in the clinic just aren't ready yet. Then I feel like there's another group of patients who, as we kind of start talking about it and they say, I've stopped before and then X happened in my life, usually some kind of stressful emotional event, and they they went back to smoking. And so for those patients, usually they kind of want to just quit cold turkey again, which I know that when you look at the data, doesn't have the best success rate. But again, I'm going to let the patient lead sometimes. So if that's the way they want to do it, that's the way we do it. And I do usually try to do like a two week, a pretty quick follow up to see how they're doing. But we also talk a lot about what support systems do you have in place? Do you have a a buddy who doesn't smoke or a buddy who does smoke that maybe you need to like not hang out with that buddy for just a little bit just till you get your kind of heels dug in on this? And so we talk about those kinds of things, too, with who is around you, what is in your surroundings that's going to either help you or hurt you with this. Then when getting into kind of nicotine replacements or those types of medications, I have not yet been in a situation where I've prescribed, for instance, Chantix or something like that. But we do talk a lot about the nicotine replacement options. And I mean, I keep going, oh, this other thing I learned, but it's true. Like, I don't feel like in residency, I learned about exactly when to use which replacement and what combination and what does Medicare cover and things like that. And I learned that in this course. And so I know that most insurance companies are going to cover not only a nicotine replacement product, but also counseling, group counseling. And the most effective combination is that combination there. And so I tell that to patients, I'll say, look, I know you've got the gum already from your primary care doctor and that's great. Or you've got, you know, one of these medications, but let's also get you hooked in with a session or a group that you feel comfortable with because that's going to improve your chances of actually being able to successfully quit smoking. Speaking of smoking and tobacco, Marijuana is pretty trendy these days, and you may have patients who are more openly talking about how they either, you know, smoke marijuana or they vape THC or they do some edibles every now and then to help with anxiety. 
do these fall into that category? Where, where like is it in the pillar? Substances that we <laughs> that need to illicit, illicit <laughs> illegal substances <laughs> in South Carolina, right? Um, yeah, it, that honestly is not touched on in the training, I'll be honest. However, because it happens and there's been some speculation, I think, about marijuana use, especially with head and neck cancer. So I've tried to keep up to date with kind of the latest. And again, I just tell the patients there's not hard and fast evidence that it's as bad as a cigarette, but that alone can be an irritant, if nothing else. And of course, with vaping, you've got the small risk of lung injury and things like that. So I will bring up, it's not your best option, but it's probably not your worst option. Like if you're smoking marijuana to stop smoking cigarettes, you're probably making a move in the right direction. So not that I ever endorse it and say, you go right ahead, buddy. Um, (laughs) But, you know, there's also a lot of patients, there's obviously an emotional and stress sort of reduction benefit to that. And that is a pillar, for better or worse. I practice in a state where it's illegal, but some people don't. And in those states, that may be acceptable. If this helps that person reduce their stress levels, that's something they can do. The risk-benefit ratio, right? Like what's outweighing what? That's a good segue into stress. So many patients deal with stressors, stress and anxiety that worsens whatever condition they have in the head and neck. And I don't feel like we have a ton of training on how to talk to patients about that. Talk to us more about how you address the emotional health of your patients and how does that play into the symptoms that you're seeing in ENT? So interestingly, I think in one of the most recent photo journals, they talked about the SNOT-22 scores and which subcomponents were predictive of depression and anxiety. And so that's where I'm like, see, it all ties together. But yeah, so for those patients, a lot of times it's one, we need to address your symptoms that are more objective, right? If you've got a sinus infection or whatever it may be, nasal inflammation. But I do try to kind of remind them that there is a mind-body connection for a lot of this, not just sinuses, but think about tinnitus and the anxiety that can often precipitate and make that worse. Think about globus. I've had patients who they just need that discussion. They need to be told, for instance, a globus patient where you've ruled out the big bad stuff and because they told you X happened in my life and I panicked and then now I can't get rid of this feeling. And so those are the patients that just need that sit down and they need that extra 10, 15, 20 minutes in clinic for you to reassure them that it's okay. And then you can talk about reframing their thoughts. And that goes back to that cognitive behavioral technique where we just talk about this is the way you feel and this is how that affects your body. And what is something we can do to have you sort of counteract that thought so that your body then feels differently? And so that's a big discussion. I don't put people on, you know, antidepressants or anything like that. Again, a lot of this is what can we do without medications? And so uh, a lot of times, for instance, we'll talk about physical activity. So that kind of ties two of them together. The studies really seem to suggest that daily physical activity is equivalent to medications for mild to moderate depression. If I have a patient who's just mildly having some trouble and they were either on a med or want to get off or considering a medication, We'll focus in on the physical activity part of it and talk about just starting to do a 20-minute walk every day, you know, or three times a week. We'll start there. So those can be helpful for especially those kinds of ENT issues that we really don't have good solutions for otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's also worth talking about sleep a little bit. Obviously, I think we've all had a lot of training on the obstructive sleep apnea, that side of it. Are you also talking to patients about quantity and quality. You know, if someone's like, I'm exhausted all the time. Well, I sleep four hours a night. Well, I can't stay asleep. Well, because there's so many different sleep disorders. Are you kind of getting into the nitty gritty of all of that too? I do. And I think the statistic is something like 60 million people in the U.S. suffer from insomnia, which is a big chunk. And so a lot of times that spills over into what we do. And maybe they have obstructive sleep apnea also, but maybe they also have some, you know, touch of insomnia. And so I do, I actually really enjoy going into like the sleep hygiene part of it. And then in some cases talking about how can we pull in some activity during the day? How can we pull in or remove some light exposures? People are really big right now on blue light and screens at night and things like that. So we'll sometimes talk about, hey, what little changes can we make? Even if it's just dimming the lights while you're watching TV versus having all the lights blaring. So light exposures, physical activity, 
again, what are you eating? Are you eating big, heavy meals and having two to three beers at night and then having trouble falling asleep? So what can we change there? So sleep's kind of a fun one because I feel like the sleep hygiene discussions really pull in all parts of it, not to mention stress and things like that. I have patients who say, I just lie in bed and I just think of all the things I need to do the next day. I had a patient, so I will credit this was not my idea. I had a patient tell me years ago that what she did to fix that problem was she just kept a little notepad and a pencil on her bedside table. And as soon as she started feeling like that, she rolled over, she wrote down what she was thinking, and she put it down and rolled back into bed. And she was like, ever since then, it's never been a problem. So I'm that Mm -hmm. kind of personality, too, where I'll just roll a deck at night. And I've started doing that. And I mean, by gosh, if it doesn't work. Wow, that's great. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get so, my bedside notepad right? because <laughs> I do the same thing. It's like, and it's the same thoughts too. It's like the same 10 things over and over, same three things over and over and over. And half the time it's nothing. It's like, oh, I've got to remember to pick up milk on the way home from work tomorrow or something stupid, you know, but you're Absolutely. like, but I can't forget to do that. And so then you can't fall asleep. Absolutely. But yeah, I think that the sleep talks are fun in a way because I get to pull all of it in. And, you know, it's eye opening on my end because I can remember a patient who we were talking about daytime fatigue and headaches and things like that. And come to find out she's been a night shift worker her whole life and retired. And now she's trying to go back to sort of a normal sleep routine. And that's almost I don't want to say impossible, but can you imagine how difficult the struggle when her body has learned to function one way for her whole life? And now we're trying to put her back on a typical sleep schedule. And so that doesn't always come out, even though we would think, oh, well, a patient would bring that up early on in the course of the discussion. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes you have to keep talking and before those kinds of things pop out and you go, oh, aha, okay, this is going to be a little harder than we thought, you know? Yeah. I feel like sleep is less controversial than all the other things too, because most people, I think we all agree that sleep is restorative and necessary. And if you're not getting enough of it, that could potentially throw anything in your body out of whack. And like you said, the quality, it's not just the quantity. I think a lot of people think, oh, well, I'm in bed for eight hours. I'm fine. Well, if you're not getting good quality sleep, if you're not getting into the full cycle and into the deep sleep stages, you're not getting that restorative benefit. And that is so important, not just to feel okay, but for your immune system to function and for you to be able, for instance, to not be so susceptible to common colds and things like that. Do you endorse any sort of multivitamins or supplements or is lifestyle medicine more about these kind of broad pillars and not specific micronutrients? Lifestyle medicine definitely focuses more on a whole food approach if you're thinking about it that way. And so I do try to stay in that lane as much as possible. But interestingly, I mean, even in our journals, as you know, we have papers that talk about certain supplements that may be an option for patients with you know, tinnitus or sudden hearing loss or something like that. And even for nasal polyps and things, there are cases where I will say, gosh, if we don't think we are already getting this in your diet, if we think it's lacking or let's do the blood test and see, then maybe we should think about a supplement. And again, goes back, like Goopy said, to the risk benefit weighing, where if you've got a supplement that has a very low risk profile, I'm going to be more apt to recommend that. Something like omega-3 fatty acids. There's not much of a downside other than maybe even the blood thing in effect is a pretty high dose to cause that. But I do tend to try to say, let's try to do this first with whole food approaches. I think there's so many more benefits to that that are unseen. And if not, maybe we think about a supplement. Have you been able to use what you've learned in lifestyle medicine for your pediatric patients and their families? So like the five or eight-year-old with ear fluid that doesn't go away or the chronic runny nose kid, or is this mostly for adults? No, I, I think it absolutely applies to kids too. We talked a little bit about kind of nutritional things you can talk about, but sleep's a big one for kids too. You know, I mean, if a kid isn't sleeping well, they're also not getting that restorative effect every night. We talk about secondhand smoke exposure. I think a lot of parents, especially, again, kids with recurrent ear infections and but the parents will say that they go outside to smoke. And while I'll say, hey, I really appreciate that you're doing that, but can I also tell you about how that smoke is still on your clothes and when you pick up your baby, they're going to be breathing it in. And so, again, I think first and foremost, you have to make sure you are not coming off as judgmental because people will just shut down and stop listening. But to try to open that door and say, did you know that secondhand smoke can also be a risk factor and things like that? 
And then physical activities, screen time with kids. We try to talk about that a little bit. There's definitely applications for kids, probably a little less when you think about this being evidence-based. There's probably less evidence behind it just because we're not doing randomized control trials on kids a lot these days with these kind of issues. When it comes to the patient education part of your visit, you do your spiel and you're talking about you have your plan and you're going to send them out into the world and then they'll come back, right? Do you give them any handouts to help them kind of remember what you talked about or do you have any recommended reading that you send with them or websites that you give them or Twitter handles to follow? <laughs> I don't know. You know, everyone gets their information from different places these days. But wh- how do you do that? Yeah. <laughs> I did it. Back, go, listen, go listen to Backtable e <laughs> Um, Yes. No, I do. I do. I have some handouts. I laugh because I have two medical assistants that I work with most days in the clinic. And I feel like they could talk to the patients and tell them what I'm going to say, because as you know, sometimes we feel like we're on repeat and we're just giving the same spiel. So those are the things that I've learned to type up. And some of it's not necessarily even lifestyle. Some of it's epistaxis management, right? How many times have you explained you can soak the tissue with Afrin and then put it in your nose and that kind of thing. But in the lifestyle world, I think one of the big conversations I have with people is the difference between a likely viral upper respiratory illness and what is now considered to be bacterial sinusitis and why we would or wouldn't do an antibiotic and what are some other things you can do to help your symptoms that's not an antibiotic or steroids. So that kind of talk I've pulled up into kind of a healthy living kind of approach to reducing the risk for viral illnesses to be maybe less severe and not last quite as long. So those kinds of things I have uh, things typed up for. I have so many, I feel like in my head that I want to type up. Yeah. And I just haven't had time yet. (laughs) There are definitely books. There's a ton of nutrition books and I'm cautious. So first of all, I don't recommend a book to any patient that I have not read myself. And so as I'm reading more, there's more that I have to offer. And there's been some books that I'm like, I would never recommend this to a patient. It's not evidence-based or it's very judgmental or it's just a bad book. But um, nutritionally, the book Fiber Fueled is really great. He's a gastroenterologist. And really, his message is just the more plants, the better. That's it. I'm not telling you to cut X out or cut Y out. But in general, just the more plants, the better. And again, I think most people wouldn't disagree with that. Sleep books. There's Matthew Walker's Why We Sleep, which was life changing. I feel like every ENT should read Why We Sleep. That was a really good one. There's one on alcohol that I want to read, but someone told me that after you read it, you will never want to drink again. And I'm like, but I do (laughs) enjoy a glass of wine sometimes. I really want to go to Napa. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah. And then, you know, like I said, there are some podcasts that I follow that I really like. There's some websites that I'll sometimes recommend that people kind of check out. And this might be kind of a silly question, but um, for your, your patients, Do you ever talk to them or the ones that use something like Whoop or like those, you know, wrist app, the ones that kind of monitor your sleep? How do you feel about health tracker devices and applications? I think it depends what they're using it for. I haven't actually had a lot of patients bring that up a lot. I know there's the Aura Ring for sleep. And I think the few times patients have asked about it, I'll just say there's some limitations to it. For instance, your wristband is not as good as your home sleep study, for instance, but it can be helpful. If your main complaint is snoring, well, some of those tracking apps are really helpful for me to hear or for you to show me how bad this is. Speaking of apps, there's a really good tinnitus management one that I found called Odo. I think it's just called Odo, and it may be like colon tinnitus relief. It's really the only one out there, but it basically is virtual CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy for patients with tinnitus. Again, I played with it first just to get a feel for it and see if it was something I thought patients would like. And so I've started recommending that one too. Do you utilize any other specialists like nutritionists or you know other people to kind of help with the education and maybe creating a plan for patients? There are nutritionists, sometimes registered dietitians in town that I've referred people to, people who, you know, wanted more where we started this process and they said they really wanted to take it to the kind of the next level. And then when I think about it, We use physical therapists in our practices a lot, right, for our vestibular patients. And I've gotten more comfortable to refer someone for vestibular therapy was a very easy thing. But I've gotten more comfortable saying, gosh, you know, I think we really just need to work on your overall strength. That's going to help your balance. Maybe this isn't vertigo. Maybe this is just disequilibrium in this patient. 
But physical therapy and getting them moving again can be super helpful. Or if they're comfortable enough, we'll talk about starting off just, again, let's walk around your block a few times every day. And if you have access to like a senior center, let's get you going and maybe do a class or get into the gym and do some strength training. That's a big one, I think, for older patients who are coming in with dizziness and vertigo. And for us, we kind of pick it apart and we go, oh, this isn't vertigo. This is disequilibrium. But then what do you do? You know, and so to explain like, look, this is your strength. This is your muscles. This is your spinal alignment. You've had three back surgeries, maybe. This is your diabetic neuropathy in your toes where you don't have that proprioception as well as you used to. This is your hearing loss. All of those things and tying it together and saying your balance is this really beautifully complicated thing that depends on all of these systems being optimized. And these are some things we can do to do it. Let's get you a hearing test. Let's think about getting you to someone who can help with your strength and your lower extremities and referring them to physical therapy in that way. So definitely from a physical activity referral standpoint, that's a big one I think we already use and we can use probably more. For your referrals to your nutritionists and dietitians, do you have particular people who are also on the lifestyle medicine train, so to speak, where they're also talking about a message of whole food, plant-based types of diets, as opposed to, I feel like there's different camps, but some people are just like really worried about protein. We talked about gluten-free, there's no sugar, like all the different camps. Do you try to refer to someone who's going to be echoing the same message so that it's not as confusing? Because I feel like as a patient, if I'm hearing, okay, I need to eat more plants, and then I go to the dietitian and they're like, well, you need to make sure you get your protein. And then I'm like, okay, well, so I'm supposed to eat, you know, more chicken and then, but I got to get all this in. Like, it can be kind of confusing. What are your thoughts on that? I think it's important to figure out what's the goal first. So if the goal is overall health, especially thinking about those kind of chronic, more primary care issues, but also how those affect ENT, if that's the goal, then I am going to try to be consistent and send them to someone who is going to maintain that message and talk about the benefits of whole foods and the benefits of a lot of plant-based foods in your diet. There are people, though, who are not a necessarily professional bodybuilder, but there are people who want to increase their muscle mass. And there is something to be said for increasing protein in that case. And so those patients I haven't had to refer, but would take that into consideration. Also, for older people, you start to lose muscle mass at a quicker rate the older we get. And so that's something I'll mention. I'll say, look, let's talk about this plant-based stuff and it's great and here's all the benefits of it. And there's some great recipes, but you also need to make sure that you are getting enough protein to meet your needs because your body right now is going to lose muscle at a faster rate than my body is losing muscle if you don't maintain not only protein, but some strength training and how all that plays into, like we said, their maybe their sense of equilibrium and things like that, but also just their general overall health. How often do you end up talking to the patient's primary care physician about, let's say, the eustachian tube dysfunction patient, and let's say there is an interest in smoking cessation, or you had a really good talk about stress or emotional health with the patient? How important is it to then go back and follow up with the primary care for some of these patients? For the patients where we're having that discussion and we sort of come to a good stopping point on our own, I don't typically make a separate effort to reach out other than obviously documenting it and making sure they're they're getting copied on the note. But there have been patients, like you said, who've maybe wanted medication for tobacco cessation or some patients that I've been working on their maybe nutrition for some ENT things, maybe it's GERD and LPR. And we're watching her blood pressure come down in our clinic when she comes in. And so I'm saying, hey, let's reach out to your primary care, make sure that they're aware and let's make sure they don't want to adjust anything on the medication side. So it's definitely needs to be a partnership because like I said, I don't feel like I'm in the position today where I can be lowering dosages of antihypertensives. But if I feel like someone is really on this path and they're doing really well, then I do need to keep in contact with their doctor to make sure they're kept in the loop. That makes sense. Well, Jessica, I feel like we could talk about this forever. We may have to do a part two. I guess I still have so many questions, but I, I think we need to kind of round it out. Anything you want to leave with our listeners, like any key points or anything that we have not asked you yet that you feel like we need to make sure we touch on before we close out? 
I just want to say that it's really this kind of exciting new area that we as ENT doctors really haven't had any exposure to. And when you look at the way I think healthcare is going to move, I think that a full body wellness approach is going to be necessary, but also desired by our patients. I mean, that's what our patients want. They want to be given the options. They want to be given the opportunity to make some of these changes, but they just need some help. And again, it's been eye-opening how much of this easily fits into daily practice. And so just finding that extra one or two minutes to bring it up, again, first check your own biases at the door and make sure you're going into this in a very non-judgmental way. But just start doing it a little bit with your patients and kind of taking notice of, is this person really here for this symptom or are they here because they're extremely anxious about what the symptom might mean? And just being able to recognize that is really important. I think it's exciting, but then again, I'm, I nerd out about this kind of stuff. <laughs> so, I think it's fun. I'm trying to um, incorporate it more and more every day. And who knows, maybe one day I can have a dedicated kind of integrative approach to it. But it's a lot of fun. If anyone has questions, I'm happy to answer any questions by email or whatever. But it's been a lot of fun getting here. And I think that it can be a lot of fun for all of us and, and really best for our patients. I think you said it best when you said it's important to be their coach, to speak to their strengths, to be able to see your physician that way and them kind of being that relationship of them looking at you, figuring out where's your health strength. You're not just there for this weakness or this illness. And how does that help you get better? I think really is a great way to treat patients as part of doctoring, as part of what we do. So thank you. Yeah, I love your style. If if I lived in Charleston, I would want you to be my doctor. You, I, I love your approach. And I think your patients are, are probably very, very lucky and very appreciative to have you taking care of them and, and thinking of them as a whole human and not just a ear, nose and not just the ear throat. fluid, <laughs> <laughs> not just your, not just an audiogram or an image, right? A CAT scan. Well, thank oh, you guys. Right. I've, this was a lot of fun for me, too. So I appreciate you having me on. Jessica has a new book coming out at the end of the year called The ENT's Guide to Lifestyle Medicine. So be sure to be on the lookout for that. It'll be a great reference to um, learn more if you guys are interested. So if listeners want to to reach out to you, do you want us to, to just have them reach out to us and then we can forward them yeah, to you? That'd be okay. great. That sounds great. Okay, absolutely. So let us know if you want to get in touch with Dr. Lee. Again, she's in Charleston at Charleston ENT and Allergy. Thanks for stopping by today. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for taking the time. It was fun. Thank you, Gopi. It's always Thank great you to guys. be across the mic from you. Thank you. Always. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at underscore Backtable ENT on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable ENT is hosted by Gopi Shaw and Ashley Agan. Our audio team lead is Karen Yen, with support from Caleb Hodson, Josh McWhorter, and Ness Smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz, with support from Taylor's version Hess. Social media and PR by Chi Ding. Thanks again for listening, and see you next week. <laughs>